Good morning, everybody. Uh, my name is Judy Dempsey, and I have, um, I'm really ashamed to say this, um, but I have to tell the truth. It's my first time to Estonia. After all the years of writing about it, um, I finally came to Tallinn with a, a, a huge amount of persuasion and elegance by the president. So thank you very much for this great chance to visit this very small and interesting country. And the hospitality has been wonderful. And it's a great conference. Thank you very, very much. Now, the second thing I have to tell you is that on the question of cyber security, I'm a novice, which means I won't be talking that much in any case. And um, the fact that I'm a novice means that even more importantly, um, to enlighten the audience here, we have a terrific panel to discuss um, what is really becoming a huge um, security issue, uh, especially for NATO, the EU, and our relations with China, and of course, our immediate neighbor here. And this panel is cyber security, as you can see, a mission impossible. And we, uh, just to let you know, Carl Bildt uh, isn't on the panel for some reasons. So um, our panel, you can see, we have um, Jane Hall Lute. She's President Council on Cyber Security in Arlington, Virginia. And Jane has huge experience having worked in Homeland Security, done a very long stint there. So she knows all the ins and outs and the political problems, economic. Steady. And some. Steady. Steady. That's, and, uh, and then we have um, a Finnish uh, colleague and great expert, Mikko Hipponen, uh, Chief Research Officer of F-Secure Finland. He's very well known worldwide in his field, cybersecurity, intelligence, protection. Um, it's great to have you on the panel. Thank you. And of course we have, who's that down there? Oh yes, it's the president. <laughs> uh, I'm glad you're better. Um, President Ilves, and thank you very much again for being on another panel, but speaking what's very close to your heart, cybersecurity. But this time around, we're going to start off with Jane. The floor is yours. Judy, thanks, thanks very much. Um, you mentioned when it came to cybersecurity that you were a novice. Um, I think most of us uh, would fall into that category with the exception of my two distinguished colleagues um, here on the panel with me. It's a privilege and a pleasure to be at this conference where the quality of the conversation I must say is extraordinary, um, and, and I deeply appreciate it. I'm going to try and uh, give you an understanding of cybersecurity, at least as, as I have come to understand it. Now, that may send you all screaming from the room, <laughs> or it may reassure you that whatever grip you have on this complex subject is, is adequate for where you are, but not adequate for where we're going. I think the whole question of cybersecurity can be reduced to to, or the whole issue of cybersecurity can be reduced to three questions. There are only three interesting questions, in my view, when it comes to cybersecurity. The rest, as we say in my religious tradition, is commentary. Um, and those three questions are, number one, how can we architect systems we can trust from components we cannot trust? The second question uh, to me, how do we preserve the integrity of your information and your identity in an open internet? And the third question that's interesting to me is, what will the role of governments be on these questions? The rest can fall somewhere underneath uh, one of these three questions. I'm going to talk about what I think the problems are, what can be done about it, and who should do the work. So how do we architect systems we can trust from components we can't? What really is the problem here? The problem is an accelerating profusion of complex boxes in the hands of all of us, ordinary users who are clamoring for ever more convenience and ever more speed. And convenience and speed are manifest in two things, ever-changing technology and software, which is pushing ever more information to ever more hands. That really is basically the problem. And most of us don't have even the most basic understanding, vocabulary, or interest to be a reliable part of the solution to the problem. No enterprise today delivers value without relying on IT and without relying on the internet. That is the problem. So how do we architect systems we can trust from components we can't? Threats are an issue here, but in my view, they're not the problem. The problem is a failure to engineer and architect an approach to IT and to engagement on an open internet that brings me to the second question, in a way that allows us to preserve the integrity of our information and our identity. What's the problem here? The problem is 25 years after a book was published called The Cuckoo's Nest, um, which documented a, a major intrusion early on in the 80s, there's nothing you can do online securely. There's, you can't 
you can't even, you don't even have to have your computer on anymore. But you can't turn it on, jump online, stop, shop, chat, visit, learn. There's nothing you can do online confident that your information or your identity is not subject to compromise. Who, who's doing it? I mean, everybody sort of uh, begins every cyber article you'll read with sort of ever more breathless representations of the dreaded foe out there. Um, Profit-driven criminals, electronic saboteurs, um, and spying governments. Things are moving fast. Um, things are moving so fast, in fact, that the problems we're going to see in 2015 or 2016 and the solutions to those problems have not even been invented yet. That's how fast things are moving. And there are no agile solutions in this space, none. I was the lead negotiator for the United States with the European Union on PNR, uh, the PNR agreement, the uh, passenger name record agreement, which some of you may be familiar with. Um, this, is, uh, this is the exchange of terabytes of information about the transatlantic traveling public. Um, among allies and, and within a, uh, the transatlantic structure and context where we share norms and we share values, but we don't share the same ideas about what constitutes privacy, for example, and the internet. And this was a negotiation that lay at the heart of aviation safety in, 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 in the view of the United States. This was a security agreement. This was not a data sharing agreement, although our European colleagues for many months um, insisted that the exercise that we were undertaking was a data sharing agreement. Well, data sharing is never its own point. You don't share data simply for the thrill of having exchanged ones and zeros. Data, you, you data share for a reason. Um, and, and in PNR, the reason was to ensure the safety of the traveling public. That agreement took 18 months to negotiate. We, had to, we were very specific about the data. It would be collected in very specific ways for very specific purposes, protected by very specific means, and took 18 months to negotiate, to negotiate. We cannot hope to achieve improvements in the security of our information and our identities in cyberspace um, if we don't develop more agile solutions and a better understanding of what it is going to take to secure us in cyberspace. Now, there are some that say, well, you know what, the market will handle this. The market, in fact, has brought us the internet as we understand it today. In 1995, there were 16 million users on the internet. Today, there are 3 billion and growing at a rate of 100 connections a minute. It's an extraordinary expansion of capability. In my view, it's changing everything. But we will sacrifice the openness of the internet unless we can figure out security. Is this where governments come in? Many of them think so. Um, what is the role of governments in ensuring cybersecurity? Now, now, to many people, this, this is an obvious question. Why? Uh, it's, it's, the answer to the question is obvious, I should say. Why? Because security is typically something that societies assign to their governments to handle. We want safe streets. Governments, you run the police. We want a safe country. Governments, you run the military. Governments make the laws through speaking, uh, you know, obviously the people speaking through their governments, but governments make the laws. Governments are used to being given the assignment for security. In fact, governments are used to being the monopolists when it comes to security space. They're either doing it or making the rules and regulations about who can. And that's true for all space except cyberspace. Governments have not been given the assignment for security and cyberspace. Why not? Why, why haven't they? Um, well, it's really kind of interesting. Why do governments have the assignment for security and physical space? Because governments have the power that matters. They have military power consolidated, the, the, the legitimate consolidated control over lethality, the power to protect us. But that's not the power that matters in cyberspace. It's the power to connect us not the power to protect us. That is the real power in cyberspace. And so if you look at the top 10 uh, most powerful, most significant, uh, largest actors in cyberspace, you run out of fingers before you get to the first government. So of the 193 members of the United Nations, no two governments are approaching this challenge in the same way. Um, so how, how, how can we think about the role that governments are choosing for themselves to play? Governments are falling into one of three categories, in my view. In the first instance are governments who are fearful of threats from outside their borders in cyberspace. 
In the second category are governments who are fearful from the threats that they perceive exist within their borders in cyberspace. And in the third category are governments who are not particularly threatened at all by cyberspace, but they are not at all cashing in on the enormous wealth that is circulating in cyberspace. So these are the three interesting questions to me. How do we architect systems we can trust from components we can't? How do we preserve the integrity of our information, our identities uh, in an open internet? And what will the role of government be? Quick responses. In the first instance, I think the answer uh, begins with hygiene. There are four or five things that every enterprise can do right now which will prevent 80 to 90% of all known attacks. Four or five things that will prevent 80 to 90% of all known attacks. One truth about troubles or about bad things in cyberspace is that all known bads have known fixes. But we're all suffering, and this is a good audience uh, for this metaphor, we're all suffering in cyber and cybersecurity from the fog of more, more. There's more wizardry, more complex technology, more, more, more um, in an effort to solve the cybersecurity problem as if it could ever be solved. And the basic answer is if you know what's connected to your networks, if you know what's running or trying to run on your networks, if you limit administrative permissions that allow people to bypass, override, or circumvent your security settings, and if you create uh, an automated system to monitor your networks, diagnose them constantly, and mitigate and correct for vulnerabilities, you will prevent 80 to 90% of all known attacks. Why aren't we doing it? We aren't doing it in part because governments up until very recently have treated major cyber intrusions as an intelligence problem. Mm. And industry have treated cyber intrusions as a nuisance. All that is changing because people are coming into the game. Thank you. Um, Jane, thank you very, very much for that. I learned a huge amount, but also I was reminded how uh, the Turkish, how President Erdogan has made huge efforts, or uh, Prime Minister Erdogan has made huge efforts to stop the internet and control it, the, the inner threat, and we've seen, we've seen um, how, how governments do actually feel threatened by the, the openness of the internet. And just before this panel, there was one remark which um, a discussion about NATO. Um, I think it was um, Ben uh, Ben Hodges. He suggested that there should be much more intelligence sharing inside NATO. But you just described why there couldn't be more, really, because the system isn't secure. But um, we can perhaps go back to that later. Okay. Um, so our next speaker is uh, Miko. If you want to pick up some on some of Jane's please do, or let's give your own kind of particular view since you're heavily involved in, in the commercial business end, I suppose. Thank you. Indeed, I am representing a company here, and I am, unlike most of the people in the audience, a geek and a nerd. My background is a programmer, and I've spent my life decoding malware, analyzing online attacks, and most of all, trying to figure out where they come from, because I strongly believe that we have no hope in trying to defend any, against any of the online threats if we don't really understand the players behind them, their motives, and why they are trying to do these attacks, because there are so different kinds of attackers. Uh, <clears throat> and the company I represent is a Finnish security company who's been in business for 27 years now. And that's, I'll, I'll, I'll delve into that just a little bit, because looking from here in Tallinn, the closest virus lab would be the virus lab we operate in Helsinki. And then when you start to look around Europe for other virus labs like that, like facilities that are capable of analyzing malware samples in large scale, you realize that actually they aren't that common. The, the next one would be found, there's one in St. Petersburg, all right? There's one in Moscow, there's one in London, there's one in Germany, and couple there and here and there in Eastern Europe. For example, France has no virus, zero virus labs. Italy has zero virus labs. UK has one. So this kind of, kind of capability isn't commonplace. And it's, it's sort of surprising. And it also gets into what you mentioned about companies being in, in crucial position, not the governments. It's the companies who, who, who operate the security of, of, of the internet. And that might not be the way we want to run it in the long term. And we have to remember, these are still very early days for the internet. 
the, the internet, okay, the TCP IP protocol was invented in the 60s and 70s. For all of us here in the room, the web really became the internet. And the web is now 25 years old. I was actually two weeks ago in Geneva at CERN and they showed me the computer Sir Tim Berners-Lee <coughs> used to program the first, uh, to write the protocol specifications for HTML and HTTP. So the web is 25 years old. In practical terms, 20 years old, because in 1994, most of us got online for the first time. And when you think about the change that's been happening through these 20 years of, of living in the web, big, big changes. Originally, it was really the Wild West. And you remember how the web was when you first installed NCSA Mosaic <coughs> or Netscape and started surfing the web. Um, one thing which has changed for all of us is that originally none of us would use our real names online. Like, you would never use your real name. You would have a nickname. That's how you would register to different forums and, and discussion places. Today, we absolutely use our real names and real identities on Facebook and LinkedIn and everywhere. So it really has changed from something very informal to something uh, actually fairly formalized. Um, another thing that has changed is, is how governments and leaders and decision makers view the internet. Originally, of course, they ignored it because who, who knew it would have become such a big thing? But eventually they woke up and realized it actually does shape opinion. It does um, matter and it does uh, represent something that they want to control. And as an end result today, in 2014, we are seeing more governmental control on the internet than, than ever before. Um, and people, the normal everyday users, whether they are end users or corporate users, when they started surfing the web, they very quickly forgot the borders. They forgot geography. They forgot distances. Because when you started surfing, you would go from one website to another. You click there, you click there. You go from one site to another, and you don't care where in the world these sites are. Like this site is in Finland. This site is in Sweden. This site is in Japan. This site is in Canada. And you don't care. You don't care where the data is, where the information is coming from, where you store your information. One world. Utopia, no borders, no geography, no distances. That's what people were thinking for, for 20 years. And that utopia, of course, never existed. And people woke up to the lack of that utopia last year with the Snowden revelations when they realized that actually the borders are still there. Mm. They never went away. Mm. They actually still matter. They might matter more than, than ever before. So in, in that way, we, we sort of had the utopia, and, 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 and then we lost it. So we've seen these big incidents over the last decade or so. Um, one wake-up call, of course, was what happened seven years ago here in, in Estonia, then a year later in Georgia. Um, in 2010, we woke up to the reality caused by the Stuxnet, Incident and in our circles, we, we very concretely speak about time before Stuxnet and time after Stuxnet. That's how milestone uh, incident it, it, it really was. And since then, you know, 2012 Red October incident, 2013 Syrian Electronic Army, now 2014 Cyber Burkut and the operations in Ukraine. It's clear now that whenever we have large real world. Um, uh, events, they always have a reflection on the online world. And that really isn't surprising because the online world really is a reflection of the, of the real world. Um, just like we have security problems in the real world, we have security problems in the online world. Just like we have criminals in the real world, we have criminals in the online world. So the fact that when there's something globally important happening in the real world, of course it's going to have a reflection effect in the online world as well. And some of these incidents are, are, are very interesting. Uh, I'll, I'll take an example of the Syrian Electronic Army and their um, operations over the last two years now. Uh, Syrian Electronic Army likes to portray themselves as a government unit, which it isn't. It's, it's basically a, uh, a militia, online militia, if you will, um, with no real um, standing at all. But they've been very visible and they've been very successful with their attacks as well. And when you think about a uh, quasi-governmental or a militia online cyber attacker, you think about them attacking their opponents or attacking military systems. And that's not what they're doing at all. They're attacking the media. They're hacking Western media. They're defacing websites of CNN and BBC. 
trying to make their message known, which is a really interesting way of, 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 of using information warfare with today's tools. That's basically what they're doing. And the most spectacular thing this small group managed to do was that they sent a fake news wire from Associated Press claiming of an explosion in the White House. And that, of course, scares people when they see a wire news coming from a large news wire like AP claiming about an a, a, a explosion in the White House. People get scared, but of course, they very quickly learn that it's actually not true. However, that wasn't the real effect. The real effect was the high-frequency stock trading bots that right now do around 75% of the stock trading on the whole planet. And bots will react immediately when they see news wires sending news articles like this. And you don't have to be a very smart bot to understand that a news wire message with the keywords explosions and White House, that means that's bad news, right? Mm -hmm. And these bots started selling stocks in massive quantities, causing a, a uh, massive drop in the largest stocks in the world. So this was basically launched by a 140-character tweet. So 140-character tweet drops the New York Stock Exchange by uh, a serious amount for multiple minutes. And you really start to wonder <coughs> where we have um, taken ourselves into and how much our society is being controlled by, by automation and, and, and uh, computers themselves. Now, the Europe <clears throat> has been, and EU has been very hurt by the revelations of, of, of Mr. Snowden for the last 11 months now, or 10 months now. Um, but in many ways, it's, of course, it's easy to blame USA and about how rude they've been with their... their um, position on the internet and how they are misusing, how they have global visibility on the whole communication of the rest of the world. However, you can also look at this from the other point of view, and you can look at this as a failure of Europe to compete. Failure of Europe to be able to produce competing services. Because the fact remains that we Europeans use US-based services all the time. Practically every single phone in this room is running a US-based operating system. Most of our computers are running US-based operating systems. Um, we're all the time using US-based web mails and search engines. Why? Because we have no alternatives. And let me prove this to you. Think about five large global American internet companies. Well, that's not very hard at all. You know, Microsoft, Amazon, Google, uh, Facebook, and so on. There's five. Now, repeat the same with European companies. Name five large European internet companies of similar size. And suddenly it became much harder. There's one large European software company, and that's SAP from Germany. They are a large global software company. They are as large as the 10 next largest software companies from Europe combined. So my point is, Europe has no software industry. Europe has no internet industry. We have failed in producing alternatives. And that is one of the reasons why this, these revelations have hurt us so badly, because we realize how reliant we are mm. on the US services, because we've been unable to produce alternatives mm. of our own. So yes, we're fighting different kinds of attackers. Of course, we have the criminals to worry about, we have the hacktivists to worry about, and we have the governmental activity, which clearly all governments that can are now participating in. Um, at the very same time, it's also very clear we've seen just the very beginning. These are still very early days for such a massive change. The web has only been with us practically for 20 years, and 20 years is nothing. Mm. The web will be with us for centuries, and we will be seeing big changes in the future. Thank, thank you very much for that, Amiko. It was a very interesting take on how Snowden actually um, shows up the lack of competitiveness of, of, the, of, the, of the Europeans, which hasn't been raised. So we have uh, our distinguished guest, uh, President Ilves. The floor is yours, and um, we're looking very much forward to your, your views on whether it is, in fact, a mission impossible. Great. Thank you. Well, <clears throat> I'm going to touch about... Uh, I'm going to, since 
every one of the issues I touch can actually lead to a long discussion. I'm going to just basically touch upon three domains that we need to be looking at. Uh, and then we'll see how the audience goes because they're all very different in the context, context of this meeting here. Uh, three years ago at the Munich Security Conference, uh, uh, the Munich Security Conference, the premier security conference for the past 50 years of, in Europe, had its first panel on cybersecurity. So that shows how much, I mean, how. <laughs> Security policy and uh, cyber, is, they, they really, it's a new thing in public awareness. So this does not mean that there weren't people doing all kinds of things, but it was in 2011 that for the first time you did that. I'm going to, I, I want to touch about on three domains, as I said, the military, the political, and ultimately what would be called the values. The first thing is that when it comes to military, you know, we have, all, we have since the beginning of the, 20th century said there are three military domains, air, land, and sea. This continues to be, these, con these three continue to be the three domains that NATO looks at. Uh, but I would argue that today cyber as a fourth domain, even though, I mean, in practice it's there, I mean, NSA and SORM and all kinds of things, uh, but in reality, our military thinking is not thinking about these things, especially when we realize that, in fact, much of what we see that's going on is if it's either state-based or it's state-organized. I mean, anything from the, uh, the, <clears throat> the uh, DDoS attacks against Estonia to 2007 to the Berkut army, I mean, it... it <clears throat> It's the, the analogy is Ukraine, I would say today, is that, you know, what's state, what's not state. I mean, we can think of much of what goes on in the cyber domain as little green men, that they are unidentifiable, they carry no clear sort of uh, affiliation, but in fact, they are there because some state is running them. Uh, then, of course, there's the role of the state. It's not just the U.S., but it's China, Russia with the Red October, now with the uh, Spanish-speaking world's Carreto. I mean, we're seeing, we're seeing things that can only be done with state effort. Stuxnet, I mean, with, there is no group of hacktivists that would come up with Stuxnet. No way. So, in fact, uh, what we're seeing now, I think, in the, uh, in the past several years, is that the stuff of uh, Philip K. Dick uh, science fiction is moving into reality, where we actually do see that uh, you can use cyber as a weapon, even though Thomas Reed doesn't think that there'll ever be a cyber war. I think that it is a weapon. And so that's one domain we can talk about. The second thing I want to talk about is actually the political side which has been used in various ways to great effect. Uh, Snowden has had a huge political effect. It's created a huge divide between, uh, between the United States and its sort of philosophical allies, Europe. Of course, one of the things that has not come out of this is the huge amount of hypocrisy involved in this because I mean, do we really think that no one else is doing this? I mean, we're going every from, from I mean, FOPSI or SORM in, uh, on the part of the Russians, I don't know, whatever you call it, uh, in China, though uh, Mandiant did produce a report naming a five-digit five digit, uh, installation in China that is involved in these things. But let's be, let's be clear, even in our own countries in Europe, I think it was in fact Mikko Hipponen who actually showed me a, uh, a personnel ad in, the, in Die Welt uh, advertising uh, for a, someone to do uh, deep packet inspection for the Verfassungsschutz um, in Germany. Uh, well, deep packet inspection means looking into people's emails, uh, basically. And so, I mean, so it's not as if in Europe we're not doing these things. Um, in addition to this hypocrisy about being, oh my God, it's the United States, uh, without looking at the other ones, the, what we, there's one more element to this, which is that what the NSA and who the others have done, I would argue is a drop in the bucket compared to what the private sector does. I mean, the use, I mean, fo tracking people on your Google searches, yeah. Uh, I mean, we, we get all incensed when we find out that maybe the NSA has done this, but this is going on all the time, all the time. Why do you get the ads that you get? 
uh, because you're being you're being tracked. I mean, one of the best cases of the combination of using of, of how to use data was uh, brought out uh, by the New York Times and also in a book by Meyer Schoenberg on big data is that. You know, there's a, there was a, comp was a company in the United States, maybe still around, that it would do direct mails to pregnant women. How do they know uh, direct, uh, how do they know that women were pregnant? It's based on their purchasing behavior with the swipe cards on their, on their uh, credit cards. And then they would deduce that if you buy certain things, we know from big data, that must mean you're pregnant. And then there's this case where then they send a direct pregnancy mail to, uh, to someone who turned out to be a 16-year-old girl. They get an irate call from the father saying, how dare you do this, this being the litigious USA. They can see they're going to get billion dollar lawsuits. Uh, they call the guy up to make a deal. And in fact, the, who's contrite? The father saying, well, uh, turned out she is. I mean, these, <laughs> this is, but this is all done with big data. I mean, because you can find out amazing things from big data and in terms of people's behavior and their purchasing behavior and what that means for pregnancy or whatever. And that is all being done by the private sector. So we have to understand there's that element as well. Um, then what I'd say is that while we, are, we, we in Europe especially have been primarily concerned with privacy, or what would be in the, in the business would be confidentiality. I would argue the next big issue, which is actually something that came up with Stuxnet, the issue in Stuxnet was integrity. Stuxnet, in fact, was changing the data. Uh, and when we think about, I mean, far worse than knowing what your blood type is by somebody, which we would get all upset about that someone sees our medical records, far worse is changing your blood type changing your bank accounts, whatever. Uh, so imagine you're RH positive and someone changes to RH negative, you get sent to the hospital, they look up and say, oh, he's RH negative, and they give you RH negative blood, and it turns out you're RH positive. All right, so that's, I mean, I think integrity is the issue that we need to, need to address in the future. Uh, and then the whole sort of social political side of this, which is that the issue of, uh, Freedom of speech online. Uh, we see in response to Snowden, um, a, I don't like the term balkanization. I think it's a typical sort of West European snide attitude towards East Europeans. I would rather call it the Westphalization of the internet, which is cuius, cuius regio, eius internet. And that is where the, um, where, where you see now a, in response, first and foremost, to Snowden, but it was going on before, which is the tendency of nation states to actually take control of their internet. Um, the, the kind of behavior ranges from simply, simply having your own internet, to uh, whatever that might mean, and I don't see how it can work, to the kinds of things we see in authoritarian regimes, where in fact, uh, you have either the Great Wall of China, and you have now the requirement to register any blog or tweeter, in fact, with more than 3,000 followers in Russia. Uh, I mean, all kinds of countries have, are taking over control and using that. Uh, m tomorrow morning, there's another conference starting here. Uh, it's the Conference of the Freedom Online Coalition, which are the countries that a very small group of countries, unfortunately, that are, that are, that are standing up for freedom online. Uh, every year, more or less, the uh, free, uh, more or less Freedom House does a survey of freedom on the internet. Estonia, for three years, was number one. Now the Icelanders crept ahead of us with a, we didn't fall behind, we're just number two because they're a little better. But, the Freedom Online Coalition represents a minority of countries in the world. Uh, some of the preliminary work that's being done for this year's report looks, I mean, it's a very broad sort of dirty data. It's not finished, it'll be published in the, in the fall, but the way it looks like in the past year, the, uh, the fr amount of internet freedom uh, in the past year uh, has decreased or gotten worse in 30% of the countries that are looked at. It got better in 10%. And so um, uh, basically, it's getting worse. Mm. 
freedom, free, freedom online has decreased in the past year. From that kind of position, um, I mean, I think we can see this is a steady erosion of what we thought once, as Mikko pointed out, everything is open, this utopian, utopian uh, sort of world that we lived in. In fact, reality has, is sort of creeping in on this utopia and with the tendencies we see sort of in the philosophical world of you know, human rights, freedom is decreasing too. So military, political, and then the sort of values issues are the three things we could, each, each of those we could talk about at length. Thank you very much, uh, President Dilvis. I mean, it is very interesting that the borders are being redrawn. I hate to use this term given what's happening in Ukraine, but the internet borders are being redrawn. That it's, it's, it is so open on the one hand, but on the other hand, it can be, as, as President Dilvers is saying, can be, can be controlled. Um, I'm going to take um, questions now. I think, I think it is an appetite for this. And um, it, um, I'll take three or four questions at a time. Have your questions, one question, per person, please, <laughs> and uh, I'll I see you in a second. And, um, and please identify yourself. So, first question here, please. Uh, yeah, thanks very much, Philip Blond uh, from ResPublica. The real issue, I think, for cybersecurity, for democracies, isn't this surveillance stuff. It's anthropological, because what the internet offers politically is an inbuilt confirmation bias. It's a polarizer. It creates a situation where people of a like mind meet other people of a like mind and don't have to negotiate with anybody else. And uh, Pew recently did research in America on levels of polarization. And they found, since they started taking those records, that America has never been as polarized as it is now. And one of the reasons for that is the internet. You don't have to negotiate with people who disagree with you. You actually meet people who are like you but are more extreme. So it drives you into different camps. And the fundamental security issue for democracies is consensus, is negotiation, is building common values. And the real security risk from the internet is the destruction of that basis. Mm. And we create ever more extreme groups particularly in the political sphere, that then can't rebuild common frameworks. But nobody, nobody talks about that as a security issue, but that is the security issue, because when you divide a polity, it cannot respond effectively to the risks we face. That's a, that's a, that's a very interesting question. Um, I, I won't forget it. Uh, the colleague on front, uh, there you are, there's the mic. Sergio Germani from Rome. Uh, my question is this. <clears throat> a couple of years ago, uh, a structure, a kind of US-Russia uh, structure for preventing the escalation of cyber conflicts was set up using the, uh, <clears throat> the nuclear, alert, uh, a nuclear alert unit. Uh, uh, this was done despite suspicions that <clears throat> a Russian, uh, that, that a good part of uh, um, cyber crime and uh, hacktivism from Russia is uh, sponsored by by Russian uh, security structures. Despite these suspicions, this this kind of org organism was created mm -hmm. to prevent misunderstanding, misperception, and you know, a possible uh, destructive cyber conflict. So my question is this: uh, after the Ukraine crisis, Crimea, and so on, what will happen to this? Will this be insulated from? From, mm. the new, from, from uh, Russian US tensions and will continue to function or not? Mm. Mm. Question. Mm -hmm. uh, please, right beside you. Yeah, uh, Francois Giray. Uh, I have two questions. The first one is uh, we, 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 we are facing a, a, a very uh, ambiguous uh, relation between the private sector and, uh, and the state. Uh, for instance, a number of uh, companies came to uh, the White House saying to Obama, uh, we, we have lost uh, billions because of the loss of trust from our customers. And uh, the more there is uh, government control, 
and uh, NSA activities, uh, the less uh, we can uh, offer reliable uh, devices to our customers. My second question is, uh, today we are facing another game, which is the game of alliance between states on cyber and cyber defense and security. Uh, we've seen recently, uh, let's say, a connection between France and Israel, a connection between Israel and the United States, connection between the French DGSA and the NSA, and so on and so forth. So my question is, what kind of alliance are we building, okay. which are probably very different from the traditional alliance, and how reliable can they be? Thank you. These are, thank you, they're very interesting questions. The polarization, probably the radicalization or the um, erosion of consensus, and the US-Russia, what happens to this after Ukraine, the uh, public sector versus state, and the, the new alliances. Jane, can I ask you, you can choose which one you would like to answer, but so, clearly. Uh, so uh, there are a number of interesting uh, things that are, um, I think polarization is overrated. Um, polar, a polarized in a political environment where 50% believe one thing and 50% believe another is an environment that compels no policy and permits any policy with clear-eyed, decisive leadership. That means you need the vision of where you want to go. If we want an open net, an internet, the biggest threat to an open internet today is the lack of security. Governments should see what they can do about fixing that. Now, governments traditionally approach security from the point of view uh, that's reflected, at least in my own country, the national security point of view dominated by the military, intelligence, foreign policy, et cetera. It is, it's strategic, it's centralized, and it's top-driven. Homeland Security, the department that I was the number two at for four plus years, is transactional, decentralized, and bottom-driven. Now, which role do you think government should play when it comes to the internet? Mm. What orientation should it take? Should it take a strategic, centralized, and top-driven approach? That's the way most of them are headed. Um, in thinking about the role they will play, taking over control of the internet, presuming that they are the national command authority when it comes to this. Well, how about if they took the approach, at least again in our case, that you are the federal partner in this and not commanding anybody, but you are working together uh, with, the, with the private sector, as, as Miko said, in the private sector, in it, with respect to most of the infrastructure of the internet, it's owned. Uh, and it's in private sector hands. Uh, the critical infrastructure of, of all the 16 uh, sectors that we designate as critical infrastructure in the United States, 80 to 90% of critical infrastructure in the United States is in private sector hands. Now, how will we mandate uh, from a strategic, centralized, and top-driven way what they should do on cybersecurity, much less anything else? We can't. Um, so governments need to understand their roles, and the polarization um, that you described, I, I accept the, that the, the polity in the United States is extremely polarized, but the internet is changing everything. It's changing everything, including the role of government in our lives. It's deminiaturizing us in ways that people find empowering. No longer is, am I content to be, you know, oh, an American, oh, a German, oh, an Estonian, um, oh, race, you know, white, black, or whatever. I'm deminiaturized online. Um, and it's empowering. There is a global cyber awakening going on right now, which is the social consequences of the penetration of the internet. People have access to more information in real time and each other in ways that they never had before. And the value proposition of governments, which up until this point has been delivering threshold conditions for security, well-being, and justice, people are now finding alternatives online. Let me just come in on this. I, I really, I think that the least of our problems is the polarization. I mean, it's a, just a function of the increase of communi social communication. There's a, there was a brilliant book written about 50 years ago, roughly, by Carl Deutsch, called Nationalism and Social Communication, which exhibit, I mean, which was about the Czechs, but is also p just as much the case here. Uh, in the 19th century, suddenly you had 
Czech Estonian language theaters because before everything was in German. And the, with the rise of a middle class on the part of the locals, they wanted their own theater and that's, and then you, they wanted to have their own newspapers and people that were never consolidated before were simply peasants who had no idea what was going on, suddenly were reading their, in their own language news, which was obviously had a certain approach, they were seeing plays in their own language, and that led to a, so that was, I mean, it, on the, it led to also to a polarization where the Estonians said, we've had enough of 5% of the country being run by people, not us. So, I mean, it's going to happen, and that's just social community. I just want to come in on that, that I, I think we've yeah. seen it before, and every time you have better communications, I mean, be it, I mean, Lutheranism was created because of the printing press. Well, I mean, now we have a, a new printing press. And you could equally argue that um, it, the internet is, is actually, um, th the flip side of what you said, President, about the values, it is actually creating a democratic discussion. It's about, it is creating politics as well, which is very important. So, so just real quickly, I think, I think one, of the one of the things about the internet um, that it's doing, or the web and the connectivity, is it's accelerating a normative convergence among people everywhere um, that's been happening for the past 100 years. Pe there are very powerful norms in play right now in, in every country around the world of inclusivity, mm. transparency, <clears throat> reciprocity, and accountability. Now, they may be struggling under repressive regimes in places, and they may be counterbalanced by important business interests and government tendencies, but, but people really believe nothing about us without us. Um, they want to know what's going on. If you're going to require me to do it, are you doing it as well? And who do we hold accountable uh, for what is happening or what's failing to happen? And this, again, is where governments feel uh, most vulnerable uh, when it comes to security. Mm. But, but the internet is accelerating uh, and the intensification of those norms. Miko, want to come in? Um, actually, moving on to the question about, yeah. about um, the nuclear hotline turned to cyber hotline between... Uh, Russia and United States. I got thinking about that because the old nuclear hotline from Soviet Union to USA used to be a physical line which actually went through Finland. Um, and nowadays, obviously, it probably isn't a physical line. I'm, I'm guessing it's a Skype call nowadays. What do you think? <laughs> uh, it was probably Skype as long as it was in Estonian hands. All right. But I, now I it's owned by Microsoft. The codes. So, yes. Now, nevertheless, I don't have to tell this audience that the power of nuclear weapons was it not in using them in wars, but in deterrence. And in many ways, we could argue that the power of cyber, cyber weapons, not cyber intelligence gathering and cyber spying, but cyber weapons, most likely or could be in deterrence as well. And one of the challenges we have in that right now is that we knew very well which powers, which countries had nuclear weapons, because they did nuclear testing. And you would know that this country and this country and this country had nuclear weapons. With cyber right now, we don't know. We don't know the capabilities of different countries. We can guess, of course. We, we have some kind of an idea which countries are good in this and which countries are not, but we aren't yet seeing public demonstrations of power with cyber weapons, similar to what we were seeing with nuclear weapons. We aren't seeing countries do public cyber war drills to show their power in cyber capability to other countries. So we don't have the deterrence model working in cyber world as it is or as it used to be in the nuclear world, which, is, which, which could be coming up. And in fact, you could argue or you could guess that this might be one of the reasons why um, three years ago the White House basically took the blame and took the responsibility of, of the Stuxnet attack. Um, when the book from David Sanger came out claiming that it was a joint operation by USA and Israel, White House never denied. Instead, they started an investigation on who leaked it which is as close as you can get saying that, yes, we, we did it. And maybe that's one of the reasons why they took, took the blame and the credit for Stuxnet to get the deterrence effect out of it. Um, and in that, in that sense, it's not just the traditional superpowers who are powerful in the cyber world. Of course, all the ex-nuclear superpowers are big players in the cyber world. So yes, it is the United States, it's the Russians, it's the Chinese. Last year, we found the first concrete examples of so-called APT spying attacks launched by both India and Pakistan, both nuclear superpowers as well. Mm -hmm. But in this world, you don't have to be a superpower to be effective. Um, uh, from the Snowden leaks, we, for example, learned quite a bit about the malware development capabilities of Sweden, which 
frankly, is a little bit surprising. If somebody would have told me just a couple of years ago that Sweden is involved in writing offensive malware, writing viruses and trojans and backdoors, that would have sounded like science fiction. But this is the kind of things we are now learning. So it is, it is happening. Mm -hmm. I would yeah. add to this, I mean, we have to also understand, I mean, one of the key things we've discovered in a positive sense, in all other, in all, completely different realms, in fact, that cyber is the great equalizer. <laughs> I don't mean cyber war, but rather, I mean, the implementation in this country of various digital solutions to solving things is far, far ahead of other countries, most other countries, including countries with a far higher GDP per capita than we have, but are still stuck somewhere 20, 25 years behind us. So, I mean, in fact, when I, you don't need, mm. you don't need the, uh, the, the traditional physical infrastructure of lots of highways and so forth, uh, I mean, physical concrete highways, to in fact make great leaps. And, as a, and, and, and just as this, the, the Syrian folks, I mean, there's, it's a country where, you know, it's, it's in civil war, yet they're managing to do, uh, if it's, unless they're doing with some other country. I mean, they're, they're doing this domestically, managing to do huge, huge damage. So in the sense that the, the traditional power relations uh, don't apply as directly, though mm. clearly larger countries have more w intellectual wherewithal than smaller <coughs> countries. But it, it, it is changing the power relationships. Uh, maybe that goes into the question which wasn't answered yet about the alliances. Um, okay, uh, let me, I'll, I'll it's just it's step it's in. It's in yeah. Those are the alliances we know about. Yes. <laughs> I, mean, yes. Yeah. I mean, those are the ones, I mean, you know, no, you haven't mentioned any, I mean, in the cases you brought, there are no mentioned alliances between you know, SORM and whatever, I don't know, something in Venezuela. Or, I mean, if you look at the allies of Russia, I mean, sort of North Korea, uh, Venezuela, and other progressive countries. Uh, I mean, we don't know what's going on there. Okay. So, thanks, President. We're going on to the next uh, set of questions. There's a group of uh, hands over here. Number one, number two, uh, and, and number three behind, um, yeah. Please identify. Uh, one question and identify yourself. I feel very inconsistent about this because I should have stopped you. You had two questions. I'm sorry, <laughs> but that's okay. <laughs> Please identify Hello. yourself. Hello, uh, I'm Jan Brizalo from Estonian Information System Authority. And uh, one year ago, uh, General Alexander here said that there will be Pearl Harbor of the, of the cyber. Uh, I asked what it is. Actually, this is, uh, by his definition, the spectacular failure of the of the critical infrastructure. Though actually, be because of the no possible uh, no automated control issues, there have been some 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 failures in the infra infrastructure. But uh, apparently, there will be one that cannot be ignored. Uh, what it will do with that for the uh, security? Uh, security that discussion what we are having here right now how will 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 this uh, this discussion look like after this uh, this paper harbor now let's assume that it hap had happened and those different you no know, actors actually in the security landscape what what they will 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 say mm. thank you uh, but just the gentleman pint uh, yeah Thomas Malavitas from APCO. Uh, the Russians have just launched non-conventional attacks against Ukraine. What can we expect to take place in the cyberspace? And what could be potentially the role of the West to uh, prevent or mitigate the risks? Mm -hmm. Thank you. Great. And there was somebody behind you? Was there was somebody behind? No. Uh, we, got, we can do one more question. If, if, and, or I'll just I'll take those two questions immediately. OK. So well, well, shall we? I think we should deal with the Ukraine one first. Oh, the Russian one first, rather. Well, what we've left out of the discussion, I mean, we're, let's not get too militarized here. I think that uh, we, we've seen a number of in, uh, attempts of international law to actually deal with these issues. And there was, uh, last year, the Italian manual published here, the, cyber, the Center for Cybersecurity, NATO Center of Excellence for Cybersecurity, published a book on you know, in, uh, the application of international conflict law on the cyber domain. Uh, I mean, this touch upon such issues as, I mean, does, can cyber lead to an activation of Article 5? I mean, the question is not resolved. 
Uh, but in fact, I mean, I think that uh, when we look at other attempts, such as the Budapest Convention, mm -hmm. Uh, which has led to a de facto organization of countries that uh, believe in rule of law uh, in, uh, in cyber and, and it's the failure of it to be signed even uh, by certain members of the Council of Europe, the originator of this, which is the two countries are Belarus and Russia. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, I think that um, we can't, we, I mean, the, the military option sort of is to, is to launch a counterattack. The legal international law approach would be then to isolate in some way or another, mm. apply sanctions. I mean, the kinds of things that we see in response to lower level conflict in the kinetic domain. We just haven't gotten there yet. I mean, we haven't really, this is part of this whole sort of uh, unexplored, this terra incognita of cyber and conflict. And I suspect slowly we will get there, that we will figure out what to do when you see that cyber attacks are being launched, or state-driven cyber attacks uh, are, uh, are coming from somewhere, and there will be appropriate action taken. I mean, we still live in a world where some people doubt the existence of state-driven, yeah. state-sponsored, uh, state-created state uh, cyber attacks. So, I mean, I think, we will eventually will get there. And if, if we ever get to a, a position where we would know for a fact that it's state launched, because that is indeed one of the great benefits for the attacker in cyber attacks, the lack of attribution. Mm. Like if they do their work right, you will not be able to prove that it's a state behind the attack. And we have seen this in previous cases, and we have also learned of, of governments um, preparing attacks where they would have the capability of taking over existing botnets, so existing criminal botnets run by real criminals to steal money, to take those over and use the very same botnets for their purposes, making it increasingly or, or almost impossible to prove that indeed it's a state operation because the very same botnet used to send Viagra spam just a week ago and now it's launching a denial of service attack against critical infrastructure. So if the attacker does their work right, the, the attribution will be the biggest, yes. biggest problem. This I would say, that this, this realm has now, this is a case of the cyber realm coming into the physical world because the lack of attribution possible exactly. in cyber attacks, I think has been used very cleverly in Crimea. Exactly. Little green men. The little green men. Because they are nothing more than bots. Bots, yes. So I, I, I want to address this, this question of catastrophic failure of, of the infrastructure. Um, and I was just listening carefully to what Miko said about attribution and our ability to know with confidence where an attack came from. But one of the lessons of the Rwandan genocide of 1994 was that we live in an age when we know before victims do that they'll be victims. Mm. Um, that was true 20 years ago. It's even more true today. What we, who will be victims in cyberspace? All of us are vulnerable right now. All of us are vulnerable right now. And we're vulnerable not simply because there are malefactors out there aiming for our systems. There are, of all kinds and stripes. But they're not, they don't number in the billions. They don't number in the millions. They don't even number in the hundred thousands. I mean, it's, a, it's in fact a kind of a knowable universe of, of malware and things that can happen to you. And again, all known bads have known fixes. There are unknown bads out there, out there of course. So how do we, how do we address, how do we address the, uh, the potential catastrophic failure of the internet, or of the internet and or critical infrastructure in the United States, it's often talked about. What if the grid collapses? You know, what if the grid is taken down by by hostile cyber? The grid's actually four grids in the United States, and it's actually really difficult to take the whole thing down. But it's not difficult or not hard to imagine that we wouldn't suffer a significant catastrophic outage that would take days to recover from, if not, and for some people, weeks. Um, and we've seen, if any of you were in New York City. In 2003, during the blackout, um, you know, uh, or in some of the major storms in the United States on the East Coast, which have disrupted power for many, it's a it's a deeply troubling thought. Is the answer to send in the military? Mm. Is that the answer? In my view, no, absolutely not. Um, the military has a role to play in defending our country and defending our country against vulnerabilities, and some of that vulnerability. And with respect to President Ilves. Um, the US military declared cyber to be a domain of, of warfare um, four or five years ago, uh, much to the consternation of a number of us who thought that whatever cyberspace is, it's not a war zone. We certainly can't manage it as a war zone. 
We can't manage it as if it were a big intelligence program. You know, if we'd learned nothing in the, in the past year, secrecy doesn't scale, okay? Secrecy doesn't scale. We have enormous capability in the private sector. The private sector gave us the web as we know it today. So what can firms do, you know, before network defenses fail, when they're under attack? They can pool their resources. There are a lot of things that can be done. ISPs are increasingly in the game interacting in a managed service way, that is to say providing cybersecurity services for their customers. You still have to pay for them, you still have to ask for them, um, and you still have to know what you're asking for. It's too hard to defend yourself in cyberspace right now, and that must change. Can I just, um, I find this very interesting. Um, you've ruled out the military, well, this is, this is good news. But this issue of cybersecurity inside NATO, I mean, NATO is not uh, agreed on whether they should be even dealing with cybersecurity because um, some of the big countries believe this is a civilian issue. I mean, at what stage do you bring in uh, a defense role or a security role when it, when it brings in the protection of, of, of territory, for instance? Well, on this, I would say the, the uh, I mean, we're still, I've, I've been saying this for years and years, which is that we have not gotten in NATO to a, uh, uh, we're, I mean, we're still in the intelligence mode in NATO when it comes to anything cyber related. We have not gotten into the interoperability mode. So you can, I mean, back even back in the days of Freedom Fries, you could take a French missile and put it under a US jet and vice versa. Uh, but it, when it comes to cyber, we're still sort of, you know, we're doing intelligence. I mean, there's maybe it's the little cooperation with the five eyes, which, in, which are incidentally the five countries that refuse to have uh, secure online identities, but <laughs> which I find very bizarre. But let me let, let me just put it uh, put out something else in response to that, which I would argue, and with this whole issue of um, that we started out with, with the monopoly of violence that uh, in the Lockean system belongs to the government. Actually, what we have done in this country is to say that uh, we, it is the responsibility of the government to prevent market failure. Uh, and offered mm. services uh, that would give you secure online mm. communication, a secure identity, and services that are based on that secure online identity. Mm. Um, I just don't think, I mean, and there is a developing cooperation with Finland to adopt a similar kind of system. Uh, and that, may, that is, I think, one of the things that will ultimately come out of this is that we will recognize that it is the government's job to mm. provide that level of security that is not being offered by anyone else uh, to at least get rid of a, lot of the, a lot of the big problems. It will never solve everything, just as you have crime and murders even in a, in a, uh, with a monopoly on violence. Uh, I think that's one direction, uh, and then the issue, and how far that goes will then ultimately depend mm. upon how much the populist trusts the government. Yeah. Uh, that, in fact, that when you have a verification or authentication of an online identity that is done in Estonia by a non-governmental sort of service, that, in fact, the government really secretly isn't reading your emails. Um, but we have that level of trust right now in Estonia. But this gets into your third point about values, which you, which you try to defend, and you see that the values are being attacked to, uh, through the internet and cyberspace. But then I have to pick you up on this. How, what, how far will the government, how would the government do it? How far will they go? Will there be checks and balances on the government for protecting the, uh, for, so, what you... So at least in our case, I mean, I want to pick up on this point. Saying that the government has a, pro a role in preventing market failure, that's one that most people would sort of recognize. Um, and, and probably agree with, but the question is, you know, do we have a good theory of limits? Um, and in what way? I mean, to ask, in the case of the United States, to ask NSA uh, to, to handle the responsibility for protecting all of the critical infrastructure in the United States is like asking a soda straw to handle traffic through the Lincoln Tunnel. I mean, when you get right down to it, I mean, what, what are we talking about here? The dot mill network is the size of this bottle cap. The .gov network, in the United States anyway, is, is the size of a two liter bottle of water. And .com is as big as all outdoors. So there's, there's, there is a role for government in this space. Indeed, every single government is moving into this space, whether we like it or not, and that may presage the end of the open internet as we know it today, as governments move in. Um, and the question, but they don't only, they have other tools at their disposal, other than military, 
um, to create, for example, a policy platform, threshold conditions again for information sharing um, in real time so that people are aware of, of the threat information. The Mandiant report that President Ilvis uh, spoke about, uh, which named names and provided pho photographs and named and, numbers, not and names. Named numbers and, and 16 digit grid coordinates for some of these locations in China, that's a, that's a private company. Um, and, and, you know, we treat some of this information as if it were state secrets, some of them are, uh, for all of our governments, but a lot of it is available and out there for the Miko Hippenins of the world uh, to go and find. I have a question over here, please. Thank you. Mark Tarmak from Estonian Diplomatic Service, uh, user of internet, a dumb oh. user maybe. Uh, that was a few days ago, the uh, meeting, Net Mundial in Sao Paulo, and the idea was to promote uh, the, the internet governance, to promote a more open internet. But uh, there are <coughs> many comments that it was used for some countries to more to control the internet. Maybe have some comments about this meeting. Thank you. Miko. Well, <coughs> of course, the United States historically has or has had the power of the internet because they invented TCP IP. They did not invent the web, but they did invent the protocol underneath. And they've been controlling in a, in a controlling position in many ways. However, from my point of view, um, United States has been a benevolent dictator. And if somebody, if one country, one superpower has to be in a controlling position, at least United States has proven that it is supporting online freedom. And a very practical example of that is that unlike almost any country in Europe, United States government does not censor the internet for its citizens. For example, we Finns, we do. And we are a very free country, yet we have online censorship of sorts in action in Finland right now. There's no such thing in the United States. So they are, they have proven in practice of, of being capable of supporting <laughs> freedom. Um, and if, if we look at the, all the awful things that we've learned about the global online surveillance and the lack of respect for the privacy of foreigners that you, that you say has proven, I'd claim that if, let's say, Russia or China would be in the position of the United States, they would have misused that position much, much worse. Um, but maybe it, it, it is time to change. Uh, and, it, and we are now seeing this uh, governance changing and, and, and it has become more global, and, and maybe that is something that uh, is going to happen anyway. Jane. I, I, yeah. I want to address this, um, this question as well in, in the sense that uh, there is a lot of shared outrage about what the Snowden revelations have, uh, have disclosed, and there's a lot of outrage in the United States as well. Mm. Um, but where is the outrage um, at the lack of defensibility in cyberspace? Where is the outrage at the ability of criminals to perpetrate enormous a heinous crimes through, through child pornography. Mm. Um, there's a far greater concern um, in many of our societies about individual privacy than about our children uh, manifest in these conversations that I find a little disturbing. The privacy issue, though, is, is a tricky one. And, and Miko spoke about the lack of US respect for foreigners' privacy. Um, and I would, I would respectfully disagree. That's not what we were doing. At, at, Privacy was at the heart of the PNR negotiations that took us 18 months to conclude. And by the way, I would, I would just say that we were able to conclude that agreement without the Germans, without the French, and without the British going along. Who would have ever predicted that from the position of the United States? No one. Um, and who would have ever predicted we would have been successful? No one. Um, yet we were. And part of the reason is, is that we engineered, we, we first of all uncovered this very different view of privacy that we have in the United States compared to Europe. Um, in the United States, um, you know, we believe that privacy is, a, is sort of pivots around the, abil the ability of an individual to restrict or limit the intrusion of government into your life. In Europe, as we have come to understand it, at least on the negotiating team, privacy is about the, the ability of the individual to control information once it's put out there for the life of the information. These are just completely different views of privacy. Um, and what we discovered was that the Europeans did not respect the legitimacy of the American view. Um, and in fact, we're insisting that their right to travel to the United States uh, was a superior right. Then, of course, you have to remind them there is no right to travel to the United States, but there is a deep desire 
on our part in a, in a transatlantic way to come to a resolution of these issues, not only for ourselves, but to demonstrate that the most difficult problems that we're confronting as governments in dealing in the internet age can be solved. Hmm. Just two issues on this. Uh, 18 months is a very short time when it comes to EU negotiations, by the way. And, and, <laughs> I, I, and also on the, on the PNG issue, I think one of the other issues, it just wasn't the data protection, especially in, in Germany, but the element of reciprocity. That if, if you were going to take our list, would we have your list as well? Uh, no, we offered reciprocity. That was not an issue. I thought it was an issue no. in the middle of the discussion, right through, well, uh, to, towards the end of the discussions. Well, in fact, the, the issue... That's right, because we were insisting on reciprocity, and there was a reluctance. And that's very interesting. Well, the Commission didn't really spell that out at the time. Yes. Um, and we, have, we have time for a, another round of questions. Or if, Mika, if you want to pick up some no, of the, pr the role of the private sector. I mean, we haven't really explored how that, the interconnection between government, security, and the private sector. I mean... This, this was raised at the Munich Security Conference and it got into a, a big muddle. And at one stage, in fact, I think you were there, President, um, I was covering it at the time, and in fact, the internet went down <laughs> on the cyber security. This was intentional or not. I was upstairs in one of the private rooms. Anyway, I couldn't send out any tweets. <laughs> there's, there's one thing which is good to, good to realize about this, the relationship between private sector software companies and, and governments, especially in the United States. Um, Silicon Valley is very powerful. Um, they've become very powerful, and right now they seem to be some sort of a um, opposing power to, to Washington. As we've seen from the comments from companies like, like Google and Twitter, um, trying to get more rights um, about what they can do regarding government requests to their data. Mm. And this is interesting because if you look at large companies like, for example, Microsoft and Google, they, don't, they no longer just have to worry about attacks into their systems from the criminal attackers and from the foreign governments. As we've now learned, they also have to worry about their own government. And this is a really problematic situation. We've learned once again from the Snowden leaks that, for example, US government has been tapping between the international data lines between Google data centers and Yahoo data centers. So they have to, Yahoo and Google have to defend their networks against their own government. We have strong reasons to believe that the flame malware, which was related to the Stuxnet malware, Stuxnet malware was um, signed with a key which was generated by the US government by hacking into Microsoft systems. And think about that. Microsoft getting hacked by their own government. And at the very same time, the one single largest customer of Microsoft is the US government. So their largest customer mm -hmm. is their worst enemy. And this, it becomes a very, very complicated scenario where private industry is providing security and is also getting attacked by, in some cases, apparently, by their own governments. Can I, um, I hate to inter inter intervene. Is there any question? I, 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 there's a question that's been on my mind every time there's a cybersecurity conference. And it is this, um, does... Um, Cyber, you touched on this a little bit, um, the manipulation of, of the internet or cyber security can actually affect, affect the markets, can actually affect the free economy. Is this a worry? It, it, it's certainly a worry uh, in the United States um, uh, because, in fact, the effects that uh, Miko referenced um, have, ha have happened. Um, there are those, and this, this illustrates, I think, a partial difference in the approaches that, that we both take to the problem. Um, there are those who believe we will solve the cybersecurity problem by mapping the threat environment um, absolutely or as fully as we possibly can. Um, I, we don't send our nine-year-old daughter out to school every morning with a briefing on watch out for streptococcal this and meningococcal that. I mean, we don't send her to school after having read her the blotter report from Washington, D.C. about the crimes that are occurring in the neighborhood. Mm. We, we send her out with a few basic instructions about hygiene. Wash your hands. Don't talk to strangers. Look both ways before crossing the street. And so to me, um, we have to do a much better job on hygiene. Uh, the Council on Cybersecurity is the, is the home of what have been known as the 20 critical security controls. Um, you know, the council is not for profit. We're not selling anything except best practice. Um, and again, the top four of those controls will prevent 80 to 90 percent of all known attacks. Now, Miko said to me when we were talking over coffee, yeah, Jane, but it won't prevent 100 percent. 
Well, well, okay, true. So does that mean we don't do that? You know, I mean, I'm presuming we all brush our teeth and floss and visit the dentist twice a year. Okay, the flossing thing, right? <laughs> but, right, why? Because the, the dental associations have told us that doing these things prevent 80 to 90% of all things that cause tooth decay. So we do them. Why don't we do them in cyberspace? This is what we need to do. We need to focus, in my view, right now, until we have clear policy, until we have uh, some consensus on the way ahead, or until we have a catastrophe. Mm. We need to focus on basic hygiene that prevents 80 to 90% of all known attacks. There's plenty of room for the boutique solution. But you and I don't need special toothbrushes with special toothpaste <laughs> for our special mouths. Most of us do just fine with what's commonly available, and it's time we adopted that mm. mindset in cybersecurity. Because it's also important to, to understand that that's not a temporary measure. That's, that's permanent. We will never be able to fix. Keep brushing. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> we will never be able to fix all the security problems. We will never create a perfect system. There will never be perfect security. These systems are being built by people, by human beings, and human beings make errors. And, and, and mm. errors used to be called bugs. 20 years ago, when you had a bug in your program, it would crash, and you would have to rewrite your, your, mm. your document or whatever happened when the, when the system crashed. Today, those very same bugs are actually security vulnerabilities, because those systems have become interconnected, and the internet connects them to the worldwide networks. So, so this, the, the, the same bugs, which used to be a nuisance, are nowadays security flaws. And people make mistakes. We will never be getting rid of those. This is permanent situation. People used to ask me when I was in government all the time, what's the greatest threat out there in cyberspace? It's, a, it's always a game of gotcha, you know, trying to get me to say China or Russia um, or Iran or whatever they wanted me to say. And what I would always say is the greatest threat out there in cyberspace are unpatched vulnerabilities that are yeah. existing in your networks. That's the greatest threat. I've, I've um, a question out there. That, maybe yes, the, please. The way we should be thinking about this is that uh, every unpatched vulnerability is uh, a Nisim Taleb black swan, because when you ha any program you have assumes it is nothing bad will happen, mm -hmm. and then something bad mm -hmm. does happen, mm -hmm. and so in fact when we, I mean, the concept, the sort of theoretical concept of Taleb on the black swan. In fact, every time someone gets into your computer. Uh, because you have a flaw or a, an area that someone has not come up to. So, and so what we're do, uh, facing is are, are programs that have errors of omission mm -hmm. having to deal with, with uh, non-errors of commission. Um, and, all, and it's quite impossible to think of all cases when you're designing a platform. Mm. And, the, and someone was out there, you have to understand someone's always looking for a way in. And then when they get in, then you end yeah. up with this black swan that takes whatever it does to you, be it Stuxnet or just reading your mail or, or whatever. Mm. And there are simple things. I was just, on the other thing on uh, what Jane said, I mean, when we look at what are things you should do, I uh, just noticed that, that <coughs> Miko has his little tablet there. Pip, oh, you mean this? Oh. Uh, I mean, I w when I mentioned this at a conference here in Estonia last year, they all laughed. But I mean, in fact, you know, every computer, you have your little camera, tape it, because that's all there. Uh, the problem with Macs is you can't shut off the microphone. Uh, but, um, but in fact, every, I mean, there are such basic things you should do. I never go to a cyber discussion with electronics. <laughs> <laughs> Good call. Um, <laughs> You guys are dangerous. Uh, yes. Okay. I think I think it's time. Let, let me let me add yeah. just oh, a brief thing about about this this where the box come from. I think a great recent example would be the case we all heard of three weeks ago, um, Heartbleed vulnerability, which was very, very bad. I'm not going to, going to go into details why it was so bad, but let me just point out, Heartbleed was a security vulnerability in OpenSSL, which is an encryption system used everywhere, not just used in the web. It's used in routers and voice over IP systems and different embedded devices and Internet of Things and, 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 and factory systems. Um, but more practically for us, online stores use it. And, and Gmail was encrypted with OpenSSL mm -hmm. and so on. So it's clearly, clearly, this is critical infrastructure. If two thirds of the web encryption is done with this piece of software, it's clearly critical infrastructure. Now the question, who built and maintained this critical infrastructure? A group of volunteers, basically five or six volunteer developers who did it as their hobby. This wasn't their day job. There's one guy doing it full time 
four or five guys doing it as a hobby outside of their daily work. The budget for open SSL for last year was $2,000. It's critical true. infrastructure run by a group of hobbyists and the critical update, the critical um, code change which introduced the Heartbleed vulnerability by accident was added by one of these coders to the OpenSSL source code in 2011 on the New Year's Eve at 11 p.m. in 2011. <laughs> ah. Think yeah, but, about that. Yeah. But that's just changed. I mean, the major five no, companies Very have good all... Point. That, that, have, this has now changed two days ago. They There's took a their checkbooks out, right? <laughs> and yeah. it's now a multi-million dollar budget. Yes. Yeah. Well, it, 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 I, I, well, this is uh, this is how this, I was going to ask President Ilves, does he regret that Skype has fallen out of Estonian hands? Well, uh, from a GDP point of view, no. <laughs> but but from but from it was one of those very special um, systems that was absolutely secure. Well, at the time. At the I time. Mean, yeah. Okay. It, I don't want to provoke this. So uh, I, I think uh, that GDPs. Uh, okay. GDP is GDP. Thank you for a wonderful, wonderful stimulating discussion. And in fact, I wonder, is it still mission impossible? I mean, you've given 80% 80, 80 it's possible. Anyway, thank you very much, President Ilves, and for Jane Lute, and for Mikko Hippenen, and for a great audience. Thank you very much. <laughs>